Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. It's lovely to be with you again at this season. In our house, we have an, an artificial Christmas tree that has been placed in all 19 homes in which we have lived over 30 years of marriage. And on it are the ornaments that we have collected from a multitude of different places and people. And when our children return home for Christmas, the first thing that they do is scan the Christmas tree to make sure that all the decorations they remember are there, some of which they made as school children. Each ornament tells its own story. And if the tree decorations aren't there, no matter how chipped, broken or dog-eared they may be, they have questions and want to know what happened. To an outsider, our Christmas tree doesn't make sense, but to us, it reminds us of the story of our family, our friends, the places we have lived, our history. And when the first Christians read, or more likely heard, the opening words of John's Gospel, they would have understood straight away quite a lot more than we do. They would have remembered, many of them, that in Hebrew, to use the term word, means object. It means something that is material. They would have known that in Greek, the word used here has a huge range of meanings. At the simplest level, just something said, but also a pattern, even the entire structure of the universe, even the substance that holds it all together and makes it possible for us to think and to be. Against this background, we can get a glimpse of just what is being said about Jesus. His life is what God says and what God does. It is the life in which all things hold together. Jesus is the place where all reality is focused, brought to a point. Here is where we can see, as nowhere else, what connects all reality. Edward Elgar famously said about his Enigma variations that they were all based on a tune that everyone knew. John's Gospel declares that the almost infinite variety of the life we encounter is all variations on the theme that is stated in one single clear melody in the life of Jesus of Nazareth. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. But this shouldn't make us forget entirely the underlying image, the life that lives in Jesus, the everlasting divine agency that is uniquely embodied in him, is like something that is said, a word addressed to us. Because like any a word addressed to us, it demands a response. And the gospel goes on at once to tell us that the expected re response was not forthcoming from his own people. As we are told by John, he came to them and they knew him not. Before we have even arrived at Christmas, in the words of the gospel, we are taken to Good Friday and to the painful truth that the coming of Jesus opens the world into those who respond to his call and those who don't. Once the word is spoken in the world, there is no going back. Your response to it says the gospel again and again is what shows who and what you really are, what is deepest in you, what means the most to you. What we say or do in our response to Jesus is our way of discovering for ourselves and showing to one another what is real and, for us, important in our lives. Jesus is the question that none of us can ignore. It's been well said that the first question we hear in the Bible is not humanity's question to God, but God's question to us. In Genesis, we read that God, walking in the cool of the evening, in the Garden of Eden, is looking for Adam and Eve, who are trying to hide from him. God calls out, Adam, where are you? The life of Jesus is that question translated into an actual human being, into the conversations and encounters of a flesh and blood human being like all others. Except that when people meet Jesus, they will say, like the woman at the well, who talks to him, about her life, she says, here is a man who told me everything I ever did. 
very near the heart of Christian faith and practice, is this encounter with God's question. Who are you? Where are you? Are you on the outside of the life that lives in Jesus, the life full of grace and truth, of unstinting generosity and sparing honesty, the only life that gives life to others? To answer that you're on the side of life doesn't mean for a moment that you can now relax into a fuzzy, life-affirming self-comfort. Like Peter in the very last chapter of John's Gospel, we can only say that we are trying to love the truth that is in Jesus, even as we acknowledge all we have done that is contrary to the, his spirit. And we say this because we trust that we are loved by this great mystery who comes to us in the shape of a newborn baby, full of grace and truth. And into that darkness of our world, the word of God enters in love and in judgment and has not been overcome by that darkness. And in the darkness, the question sounds as clear as ever today as it did 2,000 years ago. To each of us and to our church and to our society, the call of God is still there. Where are you? Let us pray. Father God, we give you thanks that you sent Jesus to us. A bundle of flesh, vulnerable like all of us when we're born. But in him is your word. A word that calls to us and asks us to place our trust in him. At this Christmas time, as we rejoice with family and friends, help us to remember that calling of who are you and where are you that comes from God the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.